to, to, to charges that are much more serious. Um, you know, because there's all kinds of depraved heart activities uh, that, went on, that would go on there, including, um, you know, indirect murder charges, actually. Uh, and so uh, those, uh, those are real issues. And if the, if the, if the United States government, um, the United States and its institutions, which we are part of, you know, living, breathing, uh, part of taxpaying, part of, even though we hold stake in two different countries, um, can engage a little more with diaspora leadership, then we can together formulate hybrid means of engaging with some of these people. And then, of course, when it comes to human rights, um, it's a very, very touchy issue because the government of the day hasn't quite realized that they have to walk a kind of fine line. Um, it is true that uh, the current president, Buhari, wants to you know, really um, stamp out corruption. But um, in doing that, you also have to maintain a kind of uh, rule of law uh, decorum um, when you grab people for low level uh, offenses and the court says, um, you know, you got to give these people or give this person a bail, and then the security agency is under the president's um, indirect or direct orders. He refuses to um, release the person that has been given bail, then you know it starts to uh, create a new monster. Uh, and so there has to be some kind of a balance in, in going on. And I also believe that uh, with the relative sophistication that uh, a lot of the diaspora leaders have, that they can offer or proffer ideas on perhaps hints that the uh, diplomats, like the ambassador, can pass on to uh, you know. The, um, the president and his people, and, and so maybe they can adjust uh, some of those things and realize that you got to work in fine line here. Uh, yeah, okay. We'll go to that line. Okay, um, uh, my, uh, my, name is right. my name is Pastor Ellis Fagbami. I'm the executive director of um, African and Caribbean faith-based leadership conference. For, for, forgive me, we actually have only nine minutes left for Q&A. The lines are still right. long, so please keep it uh, like a tweet. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. I was just about to start. <laughs> OK. Um, the, right now, churches and uh, NGOs are helping the internally displaced people in Nigeria. and uh, but. With the way the economy of, I come from Nigeria, with the way the economy of Nigeria is, uh, resources are severely limited. Now, the bigger problem is that the government of Nigeria, uh, which we, we have a monoculture uh, economy, we are, we, our economy is 70%, 80% based on oil revenue. Oil prices are down, like um, has been said by the panel. Now, why the government has a resolve, the current government has a resolve to uh, fight uh, Boko Haram and defeat Boko Haram, the resources may just not be there. Is there a plan by the U.S. government to up, up the support, the aid for the Nigerian government in order to be able to do what they really want to do? Okay. Thank you. Um, before I take the next question, for, forgive me, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Miss Ethiopia USA, who is here with us. Could you please stand? <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to appreciate the wonderful uh, program the uh, Honorable Bass started for the Africa Policy Breakfast. I believe the problem of the Boko Haram should not be seen only individually. This is a problem of the whole Africa. Africa is in crisis. But this is not seen ahead of time. We have to, have, we have to start educating people. That's why I brought this wonderful young lady, because she has a program that says that people have to be educated. We have to change the minds of people, because everybody is trying to be a leader. So they have to use some sort of a means to get to be a leader. That's why they use tribalism, ethnicism, and all kinds of things. Right now, we have a similar situation in Ethiopia. We don't know where it's going to go. Same thing is happening everywhere. So I remember 41 years ago when I came to the United States, 
we have the same problem about Ethiopia, but still I'm here. We are talking the same thing. So, and please, then about eight years ago. Please ago, make it a question, okay, please. When seven Wait, years, seven minutes. Okay, seven years ago when President Obama was elected, I was so happy because he's gonna work a miracle with the African leaders. It didn't happen. So we have to concentrate to educate and elections, to the two things that are very important. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. No more questions. There's no question on that line, okay. Go ahead. Hello there. Thank you very much for the panelists. This is for all three of you. So I'm glad to hear it's a refreshing uh, breeze to hear that corruption is the main issue that a lot of you are addressing. As we can see that President Buhari's two goals or two platforms to get uh, for the election was defeating Boko Haram and an anti-corruption. So in your opinion, has his strategy uh, last week, two weeks ago, John Kerry talked about 50 government officials were sacked for $9 billion missing from the Treasury. Does it seem those are actual anti-corruption measures, or is this political score setting? And then finally, uh, this directed towards the ambassador. Have you seen, like you just said, when you were in the government, who was actually helping or ensure that President Buhari's measures are actually not political score setting? The US government is afraid, is prioritizing security over actual governance reforms. Uh, most Please. NGOs are, yeah, thank are, you. Thank are you. specific. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Hi, my name is Gustavo Mbella. I'm with the uh, People's Democratic Party of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea. I'm a citizen of Equatorial Guinea. I'd like to address my question to Ambassador Brietti. Uh, for years, I've been uh, tackling uh, the issues of President Obiang and the support that he receives from the U.S. government, tacit support through multinational companies. I'm wondering, as you know, I've been at this since the days of Pamela Bellamy, Don Cran, Erica Box Rebels. What is the U.S. doing with all of the well, the, uh, the issues involving President Obama with regard to corruption, kleptocracy, and transnational terrorism and his support of Hezbollah. What is the U.S. doing as opposed to aiding and abetting what I perceive to be a well-known despot? Thank you. Final one. Uh, I'm Serafin Oliveira from uh, Angola. I'm with uh, a friend of Angola. A very quick question. How can you have... Uh, a win-win paradigm uh, in Africa fighting Boko Haram when you don't st well, when you don't talk about the impunity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, empowerment of uh, a civil society. Okay, thanks. Uh, just hang on a second. We'll take. Um We'll get uh, quick answers Sorry. to these questions. Uh, most of them were directed. Sorry, uh, so let me just so. Let me just be clear. I no longer work for the government of the United States of America. So, um, so although I'm a proud American citizen, my view is simply sort of my views as, as, as an academic. On the first question of what's the, to the past or what is the United States plan for increasing support to Nigeria, I would simply ask, what's Nigeria's plan for, for addressing resources for itself? This is a massively rich country that has wasted and squandered its wealth for decades. And and we are seeing the results of that now. And this goes back to the gentleman who asked the question about uh, President Buhari. Um, is this actually taking uh, uh, reasonable steps in its corruption or is it political score settling? The answer probably is yes. Uh, which is to say that it, we, it may very well be some of both. They are not mutually exclusive propositions, but it goes back to uh, not only those two questions, but also the gentleman from Equatorial Guinea. What I feel very confident in, not only in terms of my time in government, but also seeing before, uh, in terms of the public statements of American officials to their African interlocutors, but I can tell you certainly being in these rooms privately, there is not a meeting that goes by in the cases of Equatorial Guinea, where I've had the, you know, been to uh, Malibu multiple times, and Nigeria and others, where we we have not pressed, where the U.S. government has not pressed its interlocutors to focus on human rights, to focus on any corruption, to focus on any impunity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to the point now, obviously, this is, it's, it's diplomacy, it's not theology, which is to say that regrettably in the real world, there are trade-offs that have to be made in terms of how far you can push on those issues and then also how one works on, uh, on, on core interests. But I go back to my fundamental statement, uh, and I think probably uh, my, my dear friend and I have something on slightly different sides of this. There will be no fundamental change on the continent until the people actually put themselves in harm's way to demand it of themselves or their own government. And when that happens, the president said there will be consistent support by the government of the United States and others to help them do so. Thank you. Um, 
I'd like um, uh, Sam Imboni to um, uh, comment on the question from the Ethiopian side um, about <coughs> education and us uniting so that, um, I mean, the African diaspora are coming together to be able to push for policy. And then, um, Ray Gilpin, if you can talk about um, the plunge in oil prices and its constraint on Nigeria's uh, ability to fight um, to fight Boko Haram. But before that, we have one more um, member of the African Diplomatic Corps. Um, the ambassador of uh, the Gambia is here with us. Could you please stand and be acknowledged? Thank, thank you. Sam. Yeah. Um, OK. Well, in regard to the uh, question about uh, civil society engaging the uh, government um, in Ethiopia or any other part of Africa, and also the uh, role that the diaspora may have to play, I think it's, go it's going to require a continuous engagement. And there has to be a certain level of momentum that the uh, diaspora has to be prepared to continue to engage in. As uh, the uh, Honorable Ambassador uh, alluded to, there has to be uh, an element of demand for governance, good governance, demand for transparency, demand for actually people seeing the dividends of democracy in action. It's not enough to win an election and, and, and be in power and you know, ride around in you know, Air Force one or it's equivalent, but uh, there has to be some tangible um, demand for things to, to, that can be seen, that can be pointed to. And that actually brings us to, to, to the fact that there's an underclass in certain regions of Africa, uh, northern Nigeria, and then there's where the actual elites that are in power in some of those places have gotten so used to the idea of being in power that they don't they don't uh, recognize that there's a lot wrong or going down under their eyes until Boko Haram or his equivalent arises. Okay, in the southern part of Nigeria, there's actually um, rumblings of uh, other serious problems that are arising, like the Biafra movement, and then also the uh, the, uh, the Delta, um, the Niger Delta, uh, you know, fighters who have taken a break for a long time. Uh, there has to be some kind of uh, 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 a continuous engagement. And I think the training that is actually required in most parts of Africa right now is for a kind of basic uh, blue collar skills. Not everybody is going to be an academic or uh, a PhD, but there's a, there's a lack of uh, the kind of skills that people will need to actually go out there and open a small business, open up an electrical shop, open up an auto repair shop. A lot of those skills are, are going to actually drive an internal growth within the economy and also uh, begin to eradicate terrorism itself. Because when you, you can kill terrorists with bullets, but you can kill terrorism with skills and education. Okay, just a quick one on the um, impact or the uh, possible impact of the fall in oil prices on Nigeria's ability to um, fight Boko Haram. Um, Nigeria um, pumps about 2 million barrels of oil a day. Um, currently, the budget is benchmarked at $38 a barrel, which is down from last year when it was about 75 um, which, mean, which, which suggests that the government is adjusting for the downward trend in oil prices. Um, Nigeria um, pledged $111 million to the Joint Task Force. In a week, it could recoup that, if it's serious, um, from, oil, from oil revenue, even, even with the current crunch. At the point um, that um, Ambassador Bigti made about waste and squandering is important because it's not that the resources don't exist, it's, a, it's that they're either squandered or wasted generally. The challenge for the Buhari um, administration is to put systems in place, not just to identify past misdeeds, but to prevent future mis misdeeds. And this is where the point about institutions and individuals are also important, but Nigeria 
if it is serious about Boko Haram, could put in place uh, mechanisms to recoup the resources required, not just for itself, but for the multinational joint task force to operate. Thank you very much. Uh, we will take um, all the people standing by, by this mic, and uh, that will be the last round. Uh, please uh, make it uh, pl short. Uh, you know, we are almost actually at our limit. Yeah. Emmanuel Agebe, U.S. Nigeria Law Group. I work with a lot of victims, and in an 18-month period, Boko Haram deployed 70 women and girls as suicide bombers. This is the worst thing happening on the globe. The European Parliament has just called what is happening in Iraq a genocide. Boko Haram is the worst group in the world. Why isn't what is happening in West Africa a genocide? I think the time has come for us to rise up, call it what it is, and do what is necessary. What do we need to do to ensure that black lives matter internationally as well? Thank you. Um, Abdullah Mahmoud, I'm originally from Somalia, uh, 14 years in the United States Marine Corps. Um, the question I have is, um, Africa is going through uh, identity crisis. So um, the question is, if you look at the map, the world map, um, second largest continent that has the second largest population, when you look at the map, it's smaller than the second smallest continent in the world, Europe. So the perception has to change that Africa is larger than Europe. Because, and, and which means Africa is more important. There is a lot of natural resources, but the people are being dispensed as insignificant. So the question is, we have to change the world perception about Africa, that it's important. So it, we should start with changing the map. Africa is larger, second largest. So the map has to change. When is that question is going to come? Divine Anye, uh, United States Navy Intelligence Community. Um, last year, 2015, we held uh, the first cyber security conference in uh, Cameroon, and it was focused on cyber terrorism. Uh, working groups were developed, and we worked with uh, common world telecommunications organizations, interna international telecommunications union. And we asked the different communities or representative countries, Cameroon, Nigeria, and all the others in the region to work on their programs to develop uh, cyber terrorism programs. Up till now, no country has responded to our emails. None of them are ready to follow up. They are not developing any programs. We've lost contacts with most of them that were established. How can you guys help us re-establish a continuous uh, process? As we all hear once and again, it is a consistent effort. The terrorists use the cyber for fundraising to recruit and to develop their programs. And if we don't establish that, we're going to fail. How can you guys help us? Thank you. My name is Marimeka from Cameroon. I'm a community organizer uh, in my diaspora. Uh, we have heard a call from our government, from our ambassador, a few months ago. And also, we heard another call today. We came. Uh, and because um, the diaspora is, uh, the, the role of the diaspora is very important uh, in, uh, in the fight of Boko Haram. And my question is, has we just started to organize our community um, to, to collect funds to support? Uh, my question is to know, uh, is there any link between the diaspora and the U.S. government to work together? Or uh, yeah, if yes, what do you have on hand for us? Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, if you can make that question and also make it uh, for, for each of us, uh, this will be sort of uh, our wrap-up. Since you you have uh, a diaspora NGO and you have um, contacts with people on the hill and elsewhere. If you can address the question that the, uh, our sister just raised, um, sort of tips and helps for getting engaged with the U.S. government. Yeah, thank you. 
Well, um, uh, first I'd like to uh, thank the uh, uh, lady who uh, came up with that question about uh, how to engage, because it shows that her, her heart is in the right place. But um, you know, this uh, is a process in itself. Uh, in our uh, limited experience, you know, getting uh, a diaspora uh, group going and then uh, eventually perhaps, you know, moving up uh, the proverbial ranks um, you know, to maybe begin to get access to uh, U.S. institutions such as the Congress uh, doesn't always happen overnight. Um, you know, but the, the key thing is to get started, to get started with, um, uh, with that, uh, you know, proactive um, uh, move to um, perhaps you know, organize, get uh, people together, and begin to um, you know, make your um, presence known. Um, this is the information age, so some things are actually uh, a little uh, less complicated, uh, such as uh, putting up uh, information and uh, researching the issues and uh, uh, making sure that your website is up to uh, speed um, so that um, the uh, media and other NGOs and government agencies can begin to uh, notice uh, what you are doing. Uh, in our own particular case, uh, even though we took all the uh, right steps, but it took the Boko Haram uh, issue to for us to get some of the attention that we got from the media uh, in the past two years, uh, we, we had a very robust um, engagement with some um, media networks, MSNBC, and we were there about uh, 15 times, uh, Al Jazeera, uh, VOA, and a whole bunch of other uh, media entities. And we're still open. Uh, we, we you know, make sure we, we maintain that uh, presence out there that uh, will lead to folks, uh, in, especially in U.S. institutions like the Congress, which is a very busy institution. And, um, you know, they, they, they have, of course, um, all manner of issues that Congress is dealing with at any given day. And so when I see Congresswoman Karen Burns and uh, Congresswoman Wilson um, show the kind of passion they show, uh, in spite of all the other competing issues, that tells me where their heart is, and I do applaud and appreciate that. Uh, but for the rest of the diaspora and community, um, you need to we need to continue to reach out. And, and and the interesting thing is that there's actually a lot of value that the diaspora brings to these kinds of issues. Um, I'm not talking about the remittances so much, but, but, but um, in, in Nigeria, for example, which gets some of the highest remittances, the entire Nigerian diaspora, you know, worldwide, pumps in about $21 billion into Nigeria annually. And half of that is perhaps you know, from the uh, US diaspora. And without this infusion of resources, there probably will be 10 book of arms. Thank you. In the south. Yeah. Th th thank you very much. Okay. And Ray, as you um, uh, wrap up, I was wondering if you can comment on the cyber terrorism uh, question, if you can link it to your wrap up. No, ab absolutely. Um, want to, and I'll join uh, my colleague in just thanking the uh, Congresswoman for this uh, wonderful initiative. It's been both uh, thought provoking and challenging because indeed the phenomenon. Um, whether we, it's Boko Haram today or something else tomorrow is something that um, requires immediate attention. It requires um, sustained um, uh, attention as well. Um, what could the diaspora do? I think advocacy is one, and the assistant secretary mentioned that. What involvement is the other? Um, we have for many years been talking about um, innovative and creative um, approaches to community development, to community engagement, to counter, countering corruption initiatives. Um, but we talk a lot, but we don't walk the walk. We need a lot more people involved in holding elected people to account. We all know what we're talking about. We need a lot more people involved in working with the internally displaced people and the refugees. And we need a lot more people involved in helping shape policy 
because I have seen policy ebb and flow in Africa since uh, like over the last four decades, and um, we really need to be able to focus on that. Um, cyberspace is one that is um, terrifying, not just because of the reach, but the speed with which um, people are uh, being targeted. Um, we uh, really need, we, what we don't need is a shutdown cyberspace. What we, but what we need um, is to have like alternative messaging in, cyber, um, in cyberspace. We don't have as many tweets. And Congresswoman Wilson, uh, you're absolutely right. We really need to invade sp cyberspace, not just with the positive messages, but also with the consistency so people will know we are serious. We're not going away until this thing is solved. And so it's one thing to find ways to police um, cyber um, space to stop the bad people from recruiting and influencing and radicalizing, but we also need to occupy cyberspace and make sure that they know that we are watching and they know that we are involved and engaged. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Brigitte, you, um, I will, th there was a question about uh, the European Union Right. Having looked at what is happening in the Middle East and called it a genocide, I mean, the right. gist I get of it is that what is happening in West Africa with Boko Haram is more, is more devastating, but it's not seen internationally like that. Mm -hmm. I know that last November, uh, the Institute for Economics and Peace in New York came out and said that uh, Boko Haram is uh, the number one terrorist group uh, superseding um, uh, ISIS. Right. But if you look at international community, there are 65 countries in a coalition to help mm -hmm. uh, uh, squelch uh, ISIS. You don't right. see the right. same thing with Boko right. Haram. So in your wrap-up, can you look at um, sort of the, the downplay Right. so to speak, by the international community right. when it comes to Boko Haram? Right. 20 seconds. Organize, engage, and demand change. Period. Uh, so to our colleagues who are asking what we can do, I would love to see all of you uh, organize a massive uh, protest at the next UN General Assembly uh, in September uh, and say, well, what, to focus on what's happening. I can tell you what I'm doing. As dean of the Elliott School, I have uh, uh, taken the initiative to, we will create a new institute for African studies at the start of the next academic year uh, to be a place for the focus of, uh, of both convening on African issues in the heart of Fahy Bottom and the heart of the policy capital of Washington, as well as a place for engaging and, and training the next generation of students. Uh, and I would hope that uh, whatever your particular uh, line of work is, that you will take those three uh, charges of organizing, engaging, and demanding change. Thank you. Um, please join me in, in uh, thanking our expert panelists. More. And I also very much want to thank all of you for taking time. I always think that uh, February for me is the worst month in Washington, and that you braved this weather to come here this early. Thank you very much. And uh, final, finally, and most important, please let's thank Ms. Bass again. Yeah, yeah.